So you can see that my talk today is titled The Road to Rebellion. And my time period that I'm focusing on is 1830 to 1835. Um, and I wanna start uh, this and frame this discussion with a question um, that maybe seems really straightforward, um, but I actually wanna problematize this question. And, and, and I wanna do this sort of throughout my talk today is to, to think about some of the developments and the ways in which um, they both uh, address this question and then they also complicate this question. So was the Texas revolution inevitable? And if you think, if your answer to that is yes, then I would suspect that you would go through a series of events. You would have, you know, regarding causation, you would think about, well, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And that's how you would answer that question. But a trickier question, as far as I'm concerned, is to think about, in fact, that the Texas revolution was not inevitable. And when you think about it that way, you can, when you're looking at some of these developments, we can sort of say, well, what if that hadn't happened? Or what if that was, um, you, you know, uh, viewed in a different light? Or what if the response was different? And so in doing so, you sort of want to be able to have a pretty complicated idea about causation and then factors where, it, you know, events, events could have taken a different turn, if you will. Okay, so that's my sort of broad question that we're going to... Um, okay, so my next slide. Um, Part of my screen is actually, hopefully you can see some of these slides because I've got pictures over here a lot of times. Okay, so this image is of uh, General Manuel de Mir y Tehran. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time on him because I'm starting this discussion with this document that I uh, we're gonna be discussing, the law of April 6, 1830. And he's so before we get to that law, we gotta step back and we gotta think about how this came into being and sort of what was the Mexican reaction? Now, I suspect already you have spent a lot of time on the 1820s and uh, you know, addressing various colonization laws that took place during the 1820s. And, and so you're familiar with the fact that by the time of this law in 1830, we've had massive immigration into Texas from the United States. Um, and so this law is going to be in response to that immigration. And you know, when Miri E. Tehran comes into Texas, he's gonna to come into Texas in 1828. And, and essentially what he's doing is, is two things. The Mexican uh, response during this time period was both concern and curiosity, okay? You, you had liberal colonization laws for a long period of time, people coming into Texas to take advantage of, you know, uh, uh, no tariffs, um, or at least a, a break, an exemption from tariffs for a certain period of time and available land. And, you know, so, so you're probably familiar with that story. So, so Tehran is going to be sent to Texas to evaluate the situation, to, to, you know, determine, you know, whether things are going well. And I think we can probably safely say, you know, that, that um, many in the Mexican government had concerns about you know, what was going on in this northern frontier, what was going on in this northern uh, state, um, and how much control did they have. So Miri Tehran uh, comes into Texas, travels through Texas, hits the major settlements in 1828. And he actually, you know, leaves Nacogdoches in early 1829. He's going to go back to Mexico City and he's going to produce a report. Okay, he's gonna produce a report about what he saw from Texas. And I have, you know, just, just a real quick quote here. I just wanna read, you know, his concerns. Um, he wrote, Texas could throw the whole nation into revolution. And so you see that very early on that um, he was well aware that the numbers that, the, the, you know, that when he got to Nacogdoches, for example, it was very much like, you know, he was, uh, in an American town, not that he was in a, a Mexican state. So he produces this report and in response to his report, we have uh, passed in the Mexican Congress, the law of April 6, 1830. Now I wanna just sort of step back and just say what's going on in terms of the politics in Mexico at this time. You know, sort of one of the dynamics of this period, the period of uh, the late 1820s and into the 1830s is the instability of the Mexican government. 
And we're gonna talk about different dichotomies. We're gonna talk about different and competing factions during this time period. But you know, even in that while he is producing um, his report and, and, and people are responding to it in 1829, you have um, you know, the government of Vicente Guerrero in, in power, that's going to fall by the end of the year. So his report is gonna be produced at the end of 1829 his government falls as early as the end of 1829. So there's a lot of instability and I'm gonna sort of try and address some of the various uh, presidents and their um, political ideology during this time period. So we get past the passage of this law is a response to the concerns about overwhelming immigration and control and the threat that perhaps Texas may, you know, fall into foreign hands if it's not monitored. Okay, so what is the law of April 6, 1806? It, you know, uh, it, I don't like the name of the law. I just got to say, I've never liked the name, name of this law. It's really important, but it's, you know, it would be so much more catchy with a better name. Um, okay, so what is the dynamics? Well, obviously the first concern of this law has to do with immigration from the United States. So the, the, the largest part of this law or the most significant aspect of this law is to restrict immigration coming from the United States specifically. Um, not all immigration, and in fact, many in, in the Mexican Congress encouraged immigration from European centers, particularly Germany. Um, so it's, it's not all immigration, it's, it's just the United States. Um, now, there was, you know, there's other facets to this law that are, that are interesting. Um, one of the things that Stephen F. Austin, who is, you're probably already familiar with, um, uh, is able to do is he's sort of a, he's able to carve out um, an exemption for himself and another impresario, Green DeWitt. Now, these are some of the earliest and, you know, most powerful um, impresarios in Texas during this time period. And basically, they get an exemption um, that allows them to continue and fulfill their impresario contracts um, from immigration from the United States. But there's their specific, their just those two are able to do it. So there's, there's, there's a little bit of a carve out for them because of their early on of their, their early uh, colon, early settlements. Um, other parts of the, this law that I find fascinating is that, you know, you have at this point for a lot of the people that came in in the 1820s, this period is when they end up the end of their tariff exemptions. So they have to start paying tariffs at this point. Well, if that's going to be a reality for a lot of people in Texas. So, you know, how are you going to get them to pay? Well, part of this law is going to um, incur or in the Part of this law is, is the government is going to set up new custom houses. Basically, immigration um, enforcement is going to be taking place uh, as a result of this law. So you're going to be sending in, um, you know, uh, officials to collect taxes essentially on the coast. Now, it was already um, established early on that they did not want settlements on the coast or on the border with the United States. So that there's, there's a reiteration of that fact with the law of April 6, 1830, is that, you know, settlements shouldn't be on the coast uh, within 30 miles of the coast um, and, and should be further inland. But okay, so they're going to set up custom houses where they're able to collect taxes. And as you can well imagine, this is going to go over really well uh, with these settlements, with these settlers to Texas during this time period. So the collection of taxes, other factors, who's going to man these new, um, you know, an, another part of this is going to be uh, presidios or garrisons are going to be set up, uh, you know, with, with, uh, officials as well as convicts. Now, I should say that this is, you know, for a lot of the future revolutionaries, we have this, this whole represent, you know, the fact that convicts are manning these garrisons that they're, you know, uh, that they're part of this is, it's like, wow, that would be really terrible. I can see why everybody would hate that idea. Now, a lot of these convicts are just, you know, they, they were uh, sentenced to prison because they were political or they owed money debtors prison. They're not all killers, uh, but this was a good, good grounds for people down the road who opposed this law to say like, oh, I can't believe you sent convicts. Um, so, so 
convicts are going to be part of the people who are going to be manage, managing these new garrisons. So we've got um, you know, people coming in to collect more taxes as part of this law, to restrict immigration from the United States. They're going to be manned by <laughs> convicts. And one other last part of this law was that no more slavery, restricting, um, obviously people aren't coming in from the United States, but no more slaves are to be brought in. Okay, well, I just want to say a little bit about slavery on what the condition of slavery is at this time period. Um, Technically, Vicente Guerrero in 1829 abolished slavery in Mexico, but quite frankly, slavery wasn't a problem for all of Mexico. Um, and, you know, obviously we know it is going to be an important part, you're probably already aware, of those coming in from especially the South to the United States, or to Texas during this time period, they're bringing their slaves in, and slave is very much part, slavery is very much part of the vision of, you know, growing this state. Now, so in, in 1829, Vicente Guerrero says, oh, you know, abolish the slavery, but Texas gets an exemption, okay? And I think that's kind of important moving forward is, you know, if, when we think about causation, we think about well, how important was slavery, you keep finding uh, ways that slavery was, you know, that there, there were loopholes that allowed slavery to um, be legally uh, conducted in Texas during this time period. You had early laws, for example, uh, in 1828, for example, uh, that had said that, you know, it was legal to bring in uh, slaves from foreign nations and those contracts were validated. There was also uh, this notion, I've got this phrase here, that slaves, well, they weren't slaves, they were permanently indentured servants, um, which quite frankly, a slavery. Uh, but there, they had found loopholes around um, the language. So even though, um, you know, this is obviously a source of much concern on the part of, of um, colonists moving into Texas, dreaming of being, you know, uh, successful planters, having their slaves, their slaves are a part of this story. Um, there is a question as to whether or not uh, this is, uh, this whole issue of banning slavery was part was a serious issue. Um, and so obviously uh, uh, cotton expands in the 1820s and into the 1830s, um, cotton production, obviously the climate is in Texas is, is very favorable to cotton expansion. Um, and you have a lot of people moving in from the South. You know, we don't need to get into it now, but not everybody moving into Texas had slaves. Um, it's obviously an elite, uh, um, uh, something the elite had because the slaves were very expensive. Um, but cotton was part of the vision and even someone like Stephen F. Austin understood and knew that cotton was gonna be significant to the uh, future of Texas. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> I have this first number one dichotomy here. And I've been thinking about, you know, as you're teaching your students how to present some of this material, um, and how you can, you know, uh, uh, get them to think about some, some of the complexities here. Um, so I want to go into different political factions in um, Mexico, um, because obviously those colonists moving to Texas care about, uh, you know, slavery and they care about um, the expansion of cotton, but they're, it's not just those in Texas that believe that cotton is uh, beneficial to Mexico. Uh, there were people, uh, I've got liberals or federalists um, that also could have lived in Mexico City who believed that actually, you know, uh, cotton expansion and cotton, the cotton industry could be beneficial to Mexico as a whole. It could compete with the Southern United States. It was, um, you know, th they saw it as something that could really advance the economy of Mexico. So it wasn't just Texans that were concerned about, um, you know, cotton expansion and protecting the cotton industry. Um, now, I wanna say a little bit more about uh, the political factions, liberals and federalists, what do they believe and how are they different than conservatives or centralists? Um, and one of the things I said already that Guerrero doesn't last the year in 1829 through the year, Bustamante is gonna be the next uh, leader of Mexico, Mexico who comes in at the end of 1829 and he's gonna be a conservative, a centralist. So um, Guerrero is a liberal federalist, 
um, Bustamante is a centralist. Now, what, did the, what does that mean? What do they believe in? I think some of the broad strokes here to talk about with regards to federalists and liberals is that, um, you know, federalists believe that, believe that the government should not control the economy. They believe in laissez-faire economics. They believe in private property. They believe, you know, like I said, that, that you know, they want, you know, this is sort of emergent capitalism. They want, um, you know, laws of supply and demand to um, control the economy as opposed to the government. Um, so, you know, pro so that you can sort of envision if you, if you see cotton expansion as something beneficial to the economy, that liberals and federalists might say, well, that's, that's the way, uh, you know, our, our emergent capitalist system in, in this northern state should develop. Conservatives, conservatives and centralists. Oh, one other thing I want to say about liberals and federalists. They also believe in decentralized government. They believe in, in states. They believe in, you know, disseminating power amongst, you know, not just the federal government, but states and local representation and local government. So, you know, decentralized power, um, which is, you know, obviously we're familiar uh, with that. Uh, as Americans. Okay, so conservatives and centralists, well, you can see right off the top, centralized government, perhaps in the, you know, uh, through something like a dictator would control the uh, government as opposed to decentralizing it among states. Um, they also, you, when you look at conservatives, uh, political factions, they get a lot of support from um, the military, uh, as well as you know, the, the church, um, you know, this sort of top-down structure. And so conservatives do believe in government intervention in the economy. So those are two ways to think about that. So that's my sort of dichotomy number one, these competing factions within the Mexican government that really lead to instability. That's one of the things that we see during this time period that I'm looking at is that, you know, the who's in charge of the Mexican government, whether they're a federalist, whether they're a centralist, in some cases, one, you know, may morph into another, uh, but I don't want to give that away too early. Uh, so, so we have uh, these, this, this first dichotomy. Okay, so we have the passage of the law of April 6, 1830. Uh, you know, uh, you, you have this shift in government that takes place during this time period. The next event that I'm sort of gonna move to here uh, involves this person, Juan slash John Davis Bradburn and the first Anahuac disturbance in 1832. Um, why the Juan and the John? Well, John Davis Bradburn was born in the United States. Um, he's an, a very interesting character uh, historically. He was involved in filibuster campaigns, uh, you know, before the Mexican Revolution. And what I'm talking about here with regards to filibuster campaigns is he's involved in sort of unofficial <laughs> attacks on Spanish Texas during this time period. You're probably aware of some of that, those are, uh, um, you know, uh, uprisings that occurred in, the, you know, 1811, 1812. So he was involved in some of that activity. He himself is a centralist. Um, and as the federalists gained power over the course of the 1820s in Mexico, he, you know, he sort of stayed out of politics. He, you know, was, you know, he does, he's gonna move to Mexico. He's involved in, in sort of the Mexican revolution. Um, he's actually under um, Iturbide. He's, he's uh, uh, you know, he joins the Mexican military. Um, so he, he's, you know, he, he has seen himself rise through advancement uh, in the Mexican military during this time period. So even though he doesn't, he's staying out of politics for a lot of this time, at, you know, in the 1820s, he's actually gonna become uh, this, a contentious character uh, in Texas when he gets assigned a post. As a result of the law of April 6, 1830, he is going to be um, assigned to Anahuac, uh, which is a military garrison, he's in charge of it. Now, he's going to become one of the most hated men in, in uh, Texas during this time period. And it's, it's sort of interesting to think about him. There, different historians sort of present him, some historians sort of present him as a person who just you know, was following orders. He was just, you know, his, his policies reflect uh, you know, his military background and he's just a person that's going to um, you know, go along with and follow, follow whatever his commanders tell him to do. Um, you know, the, the other 
interpretation of him, and certainly locals in this area of, of Anahuac thought this, was that he was sort of drunk with power, that he was, you know, sort of stepping over, um, you know, uh, regulations and pushing his own agenda on people. So the, he was definitely not liked locally. So the next figure I have here, Jose Francisco Madero, uh, I bring him up because it's a good sign of how Bradburn clashed with, um, you know, others in government before he even clashed, clashed with locals. So Jose Francisco Madero is set, sent by the state of Coahuila, Texas to um, deal with land titles. So he's actually an, just a, an official who's going to come in and come into this area of Anahuac, which is on the coast, and I've got a map coming up. Um, he's going to come into this area and uh, issue land titles to people who had settled in this area. So that's what he's, his role is. He comes in, he's planning on doing this. Bradburn says, no, actually, the law of April 6, 1830 you know, there shouldn't be anybody settling near the coast. So you can't be issuing uh, land titles to these people. And so he has a, you know, they disagree. Bradburn has Madero arrested. Uh, so he's clearly, you know, uh, somebody that, that uh, is strong in terms of his convictions. Um, now, Madero does get uh, released uh, from arrest, uh, but that's just sort of an early sign. Now, Skipping ahead a little bit, that, that happens in 1831. 1832, you start to see uh, skirmishes between Bradburn and locals. We have uh, two, we'll call them controversial figures, William Barrett Travis and Patrick Jack, who uh, live uh, you know, near Anahuac, uh, Anahuac community. Um, and there's a controversy involving slaves. So a couple of escaped slaves make it out of Louisiana, make it to Anahuac, this military garrison on the coast. And Bradburn takes them in and basically, you know, uh, you know allows them to live at this, at this garrison um, and under his protection. Now it's kind of like, he's thinking, well, you know, their slavery has been abolished, but we know that, it's not, that is not the case in Texas. So um, William Barrett Travis is actually hired, he's an attorney, he's hired to get by a slave catcher to get these slaves um, back that have gone into the Anahuac um, garrison under Bradford's protection. Um, Patrick Jack is another figure who is a thorn in Bradford's side during this time period. He forms a militia, which you're not supposed to do. Uh, Bradburn has him arrested for that. Um, he gets out. William Barrett Travis is fighting for these slaves and, and uh, you know, he, uh, he actually uh, says that um, he, he comes up with this hoax, this lie that says actually there's like a hundred people coming from Louisiana to take back these slaves and he gets arrested for that. It's actually not even true, but he just created this story. So then Bradburn has Travis arrested. So Patrick Jack, also unhappy about this development, gets arrested again. So both of them are arrested by Bradburn. And there's a response locally. People who live in Anahuac and people who live in Brazoria, um, they, you know, fought, we'll call them a posse, uh, form a posse of about, you know, 100, 150, maybe as much as 200 people come and surround the garrison and demand the release of William Barrett Travis and Patrick Jack. Um, you know, this group, this posse, uh, end up uh, capturing 19 of, uh, of Bradburn's men. So negotiations are taking place for release. Um, there is actual, uh, you know, in the skirmish of it all, there is some, some uh, casualties, uh, but ultimately uh, William Barrett Travis and Patrick Jack will be released. Um, the other person that I have here, I just wanna mention this guy down here, He's, you know, while all this craziness is happening essentially at Anahuac, he's uh, the commander ahead of Bradburn and he is going to come into Anahuac and um, release Bradburn of duty. So Bradburn's, you know, essentially gets fired. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and then ultimately uh, P Piedras turns over Travis and Jack to local authorities who subsequently release him. Two other things that I have here sort of in the spirit of 1832, the Battle of Velasco and the Battle of Nacogdoches. Not 
the most famous battles in the history of the world, but worth pausing during this time period. While this posse fell back to Turtle Bayou, which is a community near Anahuac, they fell back during uh, you know, the conflict. Um, they had the great idea to go and get a cannon. Cannons are very popular during this time period. If you're gonna have a military conflict, you can well imagine. So they, they send uh, you know, an emissary to Brazoria to get a cannon. Well, they're taking this cannon down the Brazos River, uh, trying to get it to uh, Turtle Bayou and then on to, and to Anahuac. Um, and the, the commander at Velasco, a man named Domingo de Ugart, I, I struggle with this, Ugart, Ugartichia, Ugartichia, sorry about that. Uh, he wants, he won't let the cannon um, pass. And there is actually a battle that breaks out, uh, the Battle of, of Velasco, as a result of um, you know, trying to get this cannon passed. Uh, 10 Texans and uh, five Mexicans die as a result of this battle. So there's actual blood, bloodshed that takes place in 1832. Uh, Piedras goes back to uh, Nacogdoches, where he's from, and he's concerned about the locals and uprisings that he's seeing in 1832 in, in Anahuac. And so he actually demands that the locals turn over their weapons. Um, and they're like, no, we don't want to do that. So um, uh, they're, they're also very concerned about the law of April 6, 1830. And we're going to see, again, uh, you know, a military scourge, a, a bloodshed takes place during this time period. Piedras basically um, is surrounded and, and, and leaves and actually tr tries to head to San Antonio. Uh, and he ends up um, losing some of his men as well. So we have actual battles during this time period. So here's the map that I promised. Probably should have gone into it a little earlier. Uh, you can see here, there's, there's Velasco here. All along the coast here is where we have the new um, custom houses being put up during this time period. And you know, customs on goods coming into uh, uh, Texas during this time period. So ships that are coming into Texas having to pay customs for the first time. Uh, and they're along the coast. So there's Velasco. Uh, here's Anahuac up here, off the coast again. Uh, if I if I mention a town, I may come back to this map. So, okay. So they've you know in the process this this group that had uh, surrounded Anahuac and you know demanded the release of um, Travis and 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 um, and. Uh, Patrick. Uh, so during this time period, they're de demanding this release. They fall back, I said, I mentioned to Turtle Bayou. One of the things that's interesting that they do during this time period is instead of saying that, you know, they're, this is an uprising, we're so upset about the law of April 6, 1836, that we're staging an uprising, they actually couch their uprising in a larger political argument. So going back to the Mexican government, what happens during this time period is we see the immersion of a, uh, the, uh, uh, this figure here, who was actually around before this, but General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, I think you've probably heard of him. He's going to come into power during this time period in 1833, and he's going to claim to be a federalist. So going back to our, you know, different political factions, he's going to claim to be a federalist during this time period. And so the, those that were sort of part of this incident at Anahuac say that they're basically, you know, against Bustamante, they're against the centralists, they're for, you know, the, the federalist position, they're for the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the emergence of Santa Ana and his, and his um, taking over the government. And that's why they're really, that's what one of their big issues. They're also concerned about, and I haven't mentioned it yet, the constitution of 1824. Now, I think you probably covered this before, so I don't want to necessarily continue to cover the same story, but um, the Constitution of 1824 is something that is threatened by conservatives. And it's threatened because if you want a centralist power, then you don't believe in the, you know, a constitution that separates and disperses power among states. And so they say, well, we're for the Constitution of 1824. And these conservatives, they're violating the principles of the Constitution of 1824. And you know that's what this is what this is about. We're just stepping into a larger political argument, not really staging an uprising at this point. So that's what the Turtle Bayou resolutions are: is their articulation of their support for the Federalist position. Um, you know that kind of comes out of this time period. Okay, 
So the next thing I have on here is the Con convention of 1832 that takes place in San Felipe. Um, you know, all of this, th these things are happening in sort of a condensed period of time. 1832 is kind of a, an important year. Um, and, and what you see during this time period in, uh, is delegates meeting, okay, in the convention of 1832, delegates meeting to sort of articulate a set of grievances. And that's where I want to sort of pause because, you know, I've got, you know, a series of petitions and then we're going to have another convention in 1833. And I want us to sort of pause and get at the idea of what are people concerned about? What are they fighting for during this time period? And, you know, it kind of, again, goes back to this issue of federalism about protecting the constitution of 1824. Certainly that was something that they were talking about during this time, support for the rise of Santa Ana and the federalist position. But there were other grievances that they said as well. And I think we should, you know, sort of pause on some of them. Some of the things that they were concerned about, um, they were concerned about Indian attacks during this time period. They're on the frontier, so they want to make, make sure that they have protection from Indian attacks. That's definitely one of the things that they're, they're talking about during this time period. They're also concerned about having more judges. They're concerned about uh, having bilingual um, uh, uh, officials during this time period. So those are some of the things that they're talking about. They're very concerned about having to pay tariffs. They don't want to have to pay taxes during this time period on goods coming into Texas. So, so they're, they're concerned about, you know, um, having to pay taxes. Uh, they're also, and this is a big thing that I have actually pulled out here, separation of Coahuila v. Texas. So what this is, is when um, you're look, probably looking at laws in the 1820, one of the things that takes place is Coahuila, the state of Coahuila is put together with Texas and it becomes one larger state, Coahuila v. Texas. And the problem with that for Texas is that they don't have the population that Coahuila has. They have a lot more people in Coahuila and they have a lot more representatives in the state government there. And so it's like, you know, 12 representatives, 11 for Coahuila, one for Texas, but they also have different interests. Coahuila has a lot of cities. So, you know, you're, you're sort of basically talking about uh, many ways a state forced together that it doesn't have that much in common. And so Texas wants to be its own individual state. And that's going to be, you know, a, 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 a source of content. That's what they want. That's a big issue during this time period is getting separation of Coahuila and Texas. So, so those are some of the grievances that they're talking about. It's, it's a number of grievances, actually. Um, okay. So... They have this convention in 1832 where they start to articulate this. They, now, one of the things of the convention of 1832, nothing really comes of it. They weren't even supposed to be able to have conventions. If you had issues, you had to draw them up from local town councils, ayuntamientos. And so they, um, you know, during this time period, they, they are very much, um, uh, you know, sort of struggling, uh, you know, they're, they're not getting recognition. Nothing comes of the convention of 1832, really. But it does start a process and a conversation that takes place. So then local town councils, the Intimientos, start coming up with a list of grievances during this time period. And then they have another convention in 1833, uh, where they again go through some, you know, listing their grievances, delegates, delegates attend, the one thing I would say about the convention of 1833 that sort of makes it unique is that um, they actually say, you know what, let's go a little step further. And they actually develop a constitution for a new state that they envision, uh, the state of Texas. So they want separation and they, after the convention of 1833, and in addition to their various grievances, they basically say, you know, we want um, we're going to just come up with our own constitution for this future state that we sort of see ourselves, um, you, you know, uh, uh, having developed. Okay, so they send delegates after the convention of 1833, they're going to have, you know, come up with delegates to bring this petition to Mexico City. Um, and the person that's ultimately going to be picked to do this is going to be Stephen F. Austin. So he's going to be um, you know, uh, presenting these, the, the result of this petitions that they developed during this time period and the, the document that, they, that comes out of the convention of 1833, which of course, you know, requires the separation of Coahuila and Texas. Um, now, I wanna just point out here that I've also mentioned that the support of, you know, this isn't just Anglos in Texas that are supporting some of these grievances that we've seen during this time period. You have elite, 
uh, Tejanos like, uh, you know, Erasmo once again. Um, Navarro is a good example of this. He's also involved in some of that legislation earlier on. I mentioned about slavery. So Tejanos are also in support of a lot of these, um, you know, grievances that the Texans are articulating during this time period. Okay, so uh, Santana comes into power in 1833 as a Federalist. Seems like he's going to be, um, you know, supporting therefore Texas, Texas's interests. Now, the other dichotomy I have here is the war party versus the peace party. Um, when you're thinking about this, again, teaching this to your students, you might even think about something, you know, whether it's the Federalist versus the Centralist position or the War Party versus the Peace Party, you could even have them, you know, develop a debate, for example, where they kind of have to list the, you know, what is what, what does the War Party want versus what does the Peace Party want? What does the War Party want? Well, the War Party is basically frustrated with working within the system, uh, that, you, know, you know, looking for the government to solve some of their grievances and, and, and sort of see that that war is going to be inevitable. There's, there, you know, that if they don't see their, um, you know, demands met, that war is going to be the only out outcome. They're going to have to take to arms. Um, the Peace Party, really led by someone like Stephen F. Austin, is is this notion that you can work within the system. That you know, the way in a in a you know uh, a system of government under a constitution you work is that you develop petitions, you, you go to your government officials, and you ask them, and you demand that they take action on them. So it is whether you can work within or without or outside of the system. And so, you know, the, you see different people. War Party, a good example of that would be, say, someone like William Barrett Travis, who's, you know, noted agitator, if you will. Okay, so Austin's dilemma. What am I talking about here? Um, Austin is going to take his, uh, um, you know, issues to, uh, um, uh, to Mexico City. He's going to uh, embark on a trip in July of 1833, asking for, you know, his his demands, and he's actually gonna get some of his demands. What you will see in 1833 that goes into effect in 1834 is an, a, a repeal of the immigration restriction from the United States. So they actually, he actually has some successes and the Mexican government is giving into some of their concessions. Um, but what he's not getting is that separation. And he writes a letter back to San Antonio, San Antonio, the, the Ayuntamiento, the town council in San Antonio, and he says, you know, like maybe we just need to proceed with our own separation. You know, you know, the government isn't gonna let us do this, let us do this. We may have to work uh, without federal approval uh, on this matter. Ultimately, you know, some are alarmed by this and they turn it over to the uh, state government of Coahuila in Texas. He gets found out. As a result of writing this very contentious letter about, you know, basically saying he's gonna work outside the government um, he gets arrested on his way back from Mexico City to Texas in Saltillo in January of 1834. And for a lot of this time period, Stephen Austin is in jail. <laughs> he's, in, he's being, uh, you know, he gets arrested in Saltillo. They take him to Mexico City. He spends pretty much all of 1834 in jail, gets out on Christmas Day. Then he's under house arrest. He doesn't return to Texas until the following summer. He doesn't get to Texas until September of 1835. So you know, you're really talking about, uh, he's an important person in, in this whole story, but a lot of the things that are happening in Texas, he's, he's you know, not really a party to. Now, I, you know, we can sort of appreciate that he's probably changed his mind from his peace party uh, position after he returns to Texas, after being detained for so long, and just seeing that the, the Mexican government was recalcitrant when it came to the issue of separating Texas. I've got just a picture here of Mexico City in the 1830s. Uh, this is the time period of when uh, Stephen Austin is in prison. Um, okay, sort of, you can see on this, la this last line on the slide is, is gonna be shots fired, so you know where we're going. Um, so we sort of see these moments of contention and we also see the Mexican government giving some concessions to Texas and some of their demands during this time period. Okay, Santa Ana, what happens with him? Well, he's a Federalist, right? No reason to be concerned. Well, that actually doesn't stay the point. Um, he's back in power in May of 18. 34 and into 1835, what we see is 
um, especially in 1835, he changes his position and he becomes a centralist and well, he becomes a dictator. Um, so he controls power, he gets rid of, he, he passes a series of laws that undermine federalism, that undermine the separate, you know, separation of power. He abolishes the constitution of 1824 and he, you know, he dissolves states governments. He basically creates a new uh, structure, uh, installs new officials during this time period uh, and that shift is going to have another reaction. I, you can sort of see here my second Anahuac disturbance with William Barrett Travis in 1835, gets a cannon, goes after the garrison again, um, and gets you know the, those at the garrison to surrender. This is where we find ourselves in the fall of 1835, is that you know this this shift on Santa Ana's part, his movement to centralism causes you know. Um, people to freak out uh, and, and no longer, and move to the war position. And then you have uh, what sets off the war, the Gonzales incident in October 2nd, 1835, where shots are fired. And I think I just have uh, a little picture of William Barrett Travis here. I don't know, it, not, people just say, this is a drawing of him. We think this is what he looks like. Um, and then you maybe this flag you're familiar with uh, from Gonzales, come and take it, which involves a cannon that was given to them for Indian protection. So I believe uh, my last slide is going to really get into the colonists and, and demographics and, and um, issues that we can really deal with when we're looking at documents, because one of the documents there is Anne Rainey, Rainey Colm, uh, Coleman's uh, an excerpt from her diary. And so I want to just talk a little bit in our discussion about the colonists and who's moving in and what they're growing and what their lives are like. Uh, yeah, so my last slide, what do I, what do I want to talk about here? Well, I mean, so you're, you, you think if everyone is following the law of April 6, 1830, then that pretty much shuts the door on a lot of immigration after 1830, but you would be wrong. In fact, you know, immigrants keep coming in and defying the law during this time period. And while it's hard to get a number exactly on um, what the population of Texas is, especially since it's so transitional during this time period, uh, it's estimated that just over 20,000, 20,700 um, uh, colonists were in Texas in 1834. They actually kept coming after the law and defying the law during this time period. And so they heavily outnumber um, the Tejano population. And that's obviously gonna be a source of con concern perhaps moving forward. Um, in the instability that, that we're gonna see, and, and one of the documents really sort of addresses this, is this constant fear of Native American attacks during this time period. You know, you have, you know, land is available, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous to set up a farm or a plantation in an area that uh, is, you know, not protected. And so there is a lot of threat and there's a lot of concern uh, during this time period about from the settlers that are moving in, the colonists that are moving in during this time period about Native American attacks, because, you know, there's a lot of Anglos moving in, that's for sure, but there's a lot more Native Americans than there are, um, you know, Anglo colonists or Tejano colonists during this time period. They're heavily outnumbered. Um, so that is something that will impact, um, you know, uh, uh, farms and plantations and those settlers, a big concern of them is this, is this issue of, of Indian attack. And they expect the government to provide troops to protect them from these attacks. And that's one of the reasons why you got the cannons that are, again, are so ever so popular uh, with our uprising, which with those in, involved in the uprising is they, you know, the, the cannon that was given at Gonzales, um, that was to protect the again the town from Indian attacks, and so the Mexicans wanted their their cannon back, and that's the come and take it sign. They are, you know they they are going to launch that cannon actually on Mexican troops during that time period. So, okay, I guess I'm going to end it there. We know that there is going to be an outbreak of war, beginning with shots fired on October second, 1835. Uh, Beginning in Gonzales, things look great in the fall of 1835 for our little uprising. Um, they look less great in the spring of 1836, um, where things when, when Mexican troops arrive. So I will leave it there. <laughs>